Pan-Arab nationalism or Pan-Arabism is a movement that gathered momentum after World War I. It reached its apogee under Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 1950s and 1960s, when Egypt united with Syria to form the United Arab Republic in 1958. Iraq almost joined in, Yemen as well. For a while, it seemed that the Arab peoples might unite into one big nation. But the movement went into decline after the spectacular defeat of the Arab armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in the Six-Day War with Israel in 1967. Ever since, Islamism, or political Islam, has been on the ascendant. Today, the primary opposition parties in the remaining Arab secular states, such as Syria and Egypt, are Islamist parties. So what is Pan-Arab nationalism? Pan-Arabism is a national movement that seeks to unite all Arabs in one nation with one government. When the Ottoman Empire was chopped up by the great powers, the Arabs of the Eastern Mediterranean world had been accustomed to living together in one state. Many regarded the Sykes-Picot Treaty and deals of the great powers that led to their being divided into small states as a stab in the back. They believed that the McMahon-Hussein correspondence had promised a united and independent Arab kingdom. The new borders cut many tribes, trading partners, and religious groups into separate states. Family members found themselves suddenly separated by borders that had never existed before. Arab nationalists described the division of the Arab nation to be like a body that had been chopped into bits. In order to breathe life back into the nation, they explained, the arms, legs, and other elements of the Arab body had to be knit together. Only then could the nation be brought back to life. Only then could the spirit of the Arabs be reborn. And could they again take their rightful place at the center of the world stage. Pan-Arabism reproduced some of the uncultural imperatives embedded in Islam, which made it so readily accessible. The Quran, after all, was sent down from God in Arabic to the prophet Muhammad, who was an Arab. The Quran thus suggests that the Arabs are a people chosen by God, much like the Old Testament claims that Jews were chosen. Thus, Arab nationalists, who argued that the Arab nation had a special role to play in history, were not inventing something new, but merely dressing a central Islamic belief in new, nationalist clothing. Nationalism was built on the notion that people with common ethnicity, language, and culture form an organic community that can only find expression in a united state. Arab nationalists called for unity of all Arabs, from the Atlantic, or from Morocco, to the Arabian Gulf, and from Turkey in the north all the way down to Yemen and Oman, the ends of the Arabian Peninsula. It didn't take long before parties formed to preach Arabism, such as the Nationalist Bloc in Syria, which led the struggle against the French during the Mandate era. The Nationalist Bloc was later superseded by the Ba'ath Party, which was founded in Syria in 1947. The Ba'ath became one of the pillars of pan-Arab nationalism and eventually took power in both Syria, 1963, and Iraq, 1968. The Ba'ath's main slogan was unity, freedom, and socialism. Michel Aflaq, its founder, was a Syrian Christian. He melded fervent Arab nationalism with the neo-mystical principles borrowed from Sufism. The Ba'ath party officials associated themselves with military officers, who in 1963 took power in a coup in Syria. But it was Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt who was the principal hero of pan-Arab nationalism. He came to power following the young officer's coup of 1952, determined to drive the British out of Egypt and ultimately the entire Middle East. In the process, he hoped to make Egypt the central organizing power of the Middle East and to unite the Arab world under his leadership. The Suez Crisis of 1956 turned him in to the hero of the Arab world. When the West refused to supply Egypt with arms, Unless Egypt signed a peace agreement with Israel, Nasser refused. Instead, he signed a friendship agreement and bought arms from the Soviet Union. 
This turn toward the communist bloc was viewed as a major blow by the Western nations, which were determined to punish him and to punish Egypt. To this end, the United States and the World Bank rejected loan agreements with Egypt, which had been negotiated to build the Aswan High Dam, a dam that was going to block the Nile waters, allow canals to be dug, and expand agriculture throughout Egypt. It was the major development project that Nasser hoped to undertake. To assert his independence from the West, take revenge, and to find financing elsewhere. Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. The canal was a jointly owned project by Britain and France. During World War II, over 100,000 British officers had been stationed in the canal zone. It was a sore spot for any Egyptian wishing for independence. The nationalization of the canal escalated the crisis between Nasser and Great Britain and the United States. Egypt and France immediately began to plot with Israel for a military solution that could help them regain control of the canal. Britain viewed the canals as elemental to its international prestige and as the key to its hopes of remaining a world power. This tripart effort, the plot organized in secret by Britain, France, and Israel to cooperate in order to take the canal from Nasser failed spectacularly. In large part, it failed because the United States was against it. Britain and France had failed to tell Eisenhower of their plans, and he turned against them in the UN. He demanded that Britain and ultimately Israel withdraw their troops from Suez. It was a major blow to Great Britain. Anthony Eden, the prime minister at the time, had a nervous breakdown two weeks after withdrawing from Suez. The British pound collapsed. In many ways, it was the last roar of the British Empire. After that, the world would be divided into two major poles, Moscow and Washington. France and Britain would no longer be seen as major world powers. The success of Nasser in signing an arms agreement with Russia, nationalizing the canal and defying both Israel and the West, turned him into the lion of the Arab world. He became wildly popular and began to preach against imperialism and foreign control. The Soviet Union had leapfrogged over the northern tier and Baghdad pact, two security alliances established by Washington and Britain to help them contain the Soviet Union. The US and Western powers had hoped to hold the Soviets within the perimeters of NATO, CETO, and a Middle East defense organization. After this, the Middle East was to become a central battleground for the Cold War and the rivalry between the USSR and the US. Within a few years, it seemed that the entire Middle East might succumb to nationalist coups and join Nasser to form a united Arab Republic. In 1957, an incipient civil war in Lebanon nearly overturned the Maronite Christian government that was pro-Western. In response, President Eisenhower announced what was to be called the Eisenhower Doctrine in order to shore up the pro-Western government in Lebanon. He proclaimed that the U.S. would help defend friendly regimes in the Middle East against communist aggression. Jordan was next. In the spring of 57, pro nasserist army officers tried to take over. The U.S. moved the Sixth Fleet toward Jordan to help shore up its government and divvied up $10 billion between Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon in order to supply them with arms and shore up their governments. But it was Syria that made the most dramatic move into Nasser's orbit. Following a failed American coup in Damascus in August 1957 that was meant to keep Syria from signing its own arms agreement with the Soviet Union, President Shukri Khwatli proclaimed a united Arab Republic. He signed away Syria's independence to President Nasser, who became president of the UAR. The UAR electrified the Arab world. 
Four months later, in July 1958, Iraq followed suit. Nationalist officers overthrew the Hashemite monarchy. King Faisal II and his family were summarily shot and then dragged around town from the backs of cars by an angry mob. The Hashemites were the cornerstone of British sport in the region. Their fall in Iraq was a tremendous blow to British prestige. It was, in many ways, a fallout of the failed Suez campaign. Abdelkrim Qasim took power and soon began triple unity talks to unite Iraq with the United Arab Republic. But union was never consummated. Iraq refused to subordinate itself to Egypt. Nasser would not accept the United Republic in which Egypt and Iraq were equals. Nasser accused Qasim of being a stooge of international communism. Relations between the two countries became rancorous and accusatory. Syria's political parties had all been disbanded after unification, and the Syrian parliament had moved to Cairo. That same summer, the U.S. sent 15,000 troops to help President Shamoun of Lebanon stay in power. Lebanese Muslims pushed their government to join the newly created UAR. Christian Lebanese wanted nothing of it. They wanted to keep Lebanon firmly aligned with the Western powers. Growing disagreements among the Arab nationalists led to the breakup of the UAR in 1961. And from that moment on, Nasser's star began to dim, as did the fortunes of pan-Arab nationalism. Mm -hmm.